I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk Live. <laughs> Good to see you all here. Thank you for coming to the Central Library here in the Neil Morgan Auditorium. It's a wonderful place to be and to do music and to talk about music. It's sort of interesting, these last two seasons, last season, we had two operas by the same composer, and those operas were written back to back. Puccini's Tosca, which was uh, premiered in 1900, and Madama Butterfly, the first version of which premiered, I believe, in 1904, if my memory serves me correctly. This year, I'm not sure how it happened. Well, maybe I am. But um, we have two Verdi operas, La Traviata and Falstaff. Now, we're doing, in, we're doing them in reverse order. La, Falstaff will come first, and then later on in the season, La Traviata. But what is, is absolutely fascinating to me about these two operas is that they are exactly 40 years apart. La Traviata premiered in 1853. Falstaff premiered in 1893. Verdi was 80 years old. It gives me pause <laughs> and hope uh, that someone could be that mentally active and write two absolutely brilliant operas back to back at the end of his more than 50 year long career, Otello and then Falstaff. But it gives us a wonderful opportunity, I think, to take a look at two different periods in uh, Verdi's output, in his, his uh, creative work. One in his middle period, so-called, where we find operas like Il Trovatore, uh, Rigoletto, and uh, of course, La Traviata, and then his late period, which could include Aida and the Verdi Requiem, uh, but certainly, and most importantly, Otello and Falstaff. So I'm gonna compare and contrast. There are ways in which these two operas could not be more different. And there are ways where it's obvious that both these operas, even though there's 40 years apart, come from the same pen. It's very interesting. But I want to give you an, a, a clue on what it is that makes these two operas work. How Verdi used music to dig into the human heart, uh, human emotions uh, and feelings and to describe in sometimes very exact ways exactly what's going on in the drama, a very tragic drama in the case of La Traviata or in the comedy of Falstaff. And Falstaff is indeed very, very funny. Um, the Verdi scholar Julian Budden wrote a wonderful three-volume monograph about Verdi's operas. He said something that, that really struck me, and that is, beginning in the middle period, Verdi would write a traditional opera paying homage to the traditional structures of Italian opera. And boy, you follow those structures, uh, uh, and if you didn't, your life was in peril because the audience expected these structures, they expected these things. So there would be an opera that he would follow that, and then it would be followed by an opera where he'd try to stretch the definition of Italian opera, that he would try to sort of explode the uh, traditions and the, the structures of Italian opera. So there'd be a traditional opera followed by an experimental opera, starting with Stifelio in 1850, which was more of a traditional piece, followed by Rigoletto. And if you think about Rigoletto and even the main character, that hunchback jester, right? Talk about exploding the traditions of Italian opera. Who writes an opera about a hunchback? <laughs> Who tells jokes for a living? Uh, 1851, a very experimental, just you know, pushing forward, followed by Il Trovatore, which is probably Verdi's most traditional opera and really follows the form that had been given down to him by composers like Donizetti, Bellini, Rossini. That was 1853. And in the same year, 1853, but later, La Traviata. 
which is more of an experimental opera, more pushing the boundaries, exploding those things that, that audiences came to expect. Then followed by Le Vêpre Sicilienne, which was written for Paris, a Verdi writing in the traditional manner of the Paris, of the French Grand Opera. So he was following a different set of rules, but definitely a set of rules for opera in France rather than in Italy, and, and so forth. So this pattern seems to be set up and La Traviata is right in the middle of all that, which I think is really fascinating. Now, what makes Traviata more of an experiment than, uh, let's say, Trovatore or Stifelio? And it's in the little things. It may seem like the opera is blossoming from one gorgeous melody to another, and it does, and I'll, I'll make a huge point of that later on. Um, but what that does for the drama is that it enlivens the human characters in a way that they hadn't been enlivened before. Take, for instance, the double aria. Uh, just to describe it briefly for you, uh, it, 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 a, a first movement that is marked andante or cantabile. It has beautiful flowing phrases. It's very poetic, and it, it, it goes inward. The character reflects, he or she reflects on what's going on uh, in the drama in a very sort of dreamy, lyrical, beautiful way. Then there's a little bit of recitative or an announcement by someone or a chorus comes in and interrupts and then you've got a rousing second movement called the cabaletta, which is faster and is meant to show off the voice, the qualities of the voice, and get the character off stage as quickly as possible to as much applause as possible. <laughs> so that's the standard and usually there wasn't a lot of fooling around with that structure. There'd be a brief recitative before the cantabile, and then this interruption, which would change the drama, or the dramatic focus, then the, the, the cabaletta, and off they went, and we'd go on to the next act or the next scene. Think in La Traviata, at the end of act one, Violetta, she'd just met this young man from the provinces, literally, from Provence, and uh, he's pleaded his love, he's made his case to her that he, he really wants her to be his lover. And he leaves and she's alone. And there's this lengthy recitative, a dialogue with herself, an internal dialogue. What, what is my life about? What am I going to do? And what, what's, what's going on here? And that's the cantabile. And it's very beautiful, a force lui, you might remember it. And then there's a lengthy recitative before the cabaletta, Sempre Libera, uh, in which she sort of changes her mind as well. Well, maybe I'll allow myself to fall in love. Maybe this is a great opportunity for me. And she sings this brilliant uh, set piece. But it, it, it doesn't feel like a double aria, is my point. You don't really feel like there's a movement and a movement. It's a, a, a full dramatic structure that makes human sense. And by trying to be true to the, to the drama, by trying to be more human, Verdi explodes the structure. He makes it something else, which is absolutely brilliant. But experimenting, even the prelude is an experiment. It's written for the high strings in their highest register, playing in B minor, which is very difficult to tune, and playing not piano, not pianissimo, but pianissimo. Three Ps, as softly as possible. And we get this. And this chromatic passage going down. Which leaves you hanging. It's gorgeous music. But what a, what a risk 
Now, now think about this. Well, I have to tell you what life was like in the opera house in the mid-19th century in Italy, right? If you were a subscriber, it didn't mean that you bought one ticket for one performance of each opera that was played during the season. It meant that you were one of the families that built the opera house. And you got a box. And you owned the box. And the box was where you sat with your family to watch the opera, all of them, as many times as you wished. You could come and go as you pleased, or give the box over to friends. The opera house, particularly the La Fenice in uh, Venice, which is where La Traviata premiered, more about that later, that was a fiasco, um, was a real community center. I mean, the La Fenice was where you went to make business deals. It's where you went to meet your business partner and their wives. It's where you introduced marriageable aged children to each other to have a night out on the town. Um, it was a place where you could gamble and eat, right? And that, that those boxes had antechambers, smaller little rooms that were separated with maybe a curtain or a door in some cases, where it, your servant could, you know, toss a little salad or make a pasta, or you could gamble with your friends, or you could make love to your mistress. All sorts of things went on in those little chambres separées, right? Um, so th these were not quiet places. They weren't like today where you come in, you sit down, the lights go down, and you're very, very quiet, and you politely applaud, except here in San Diego, if you like something, you stand up immediately, and then you applaud wildly. <laughs> Although we like that, but um, uh, uh, so so these were loud places. These were loud places, and you get what the hell was he thinking? <laughs> Who's going to hear that at the La Fenice in Venice? I would love to have been in that audience to 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 to, to see how that experiment worked or didn't. And maybe it was different enough from everything else they heard that they paid attention. But usually, you had a big you know, statement at the beginning. And the big statement from the orchestra would say, pay attention, like the beginning of Il Trovatore. A drum roll. And then the whole orchestra. You're going to pay attention, <laughs> right? Wake up, the opera's starting. And it's, what, 16 bars before we get the payoff. And when I'm sure, the audience began to listen. attract your attention. Um, and, and that finally announced the beginning of this opera and really what it was all going to be about. The opera La Traviata and all the other middle period operas are driven by melody. What do I mean by that? Here's a wonderful example, and I think you'll hear it immediately. Alfredo comes to the house. He's fallen in love with Violetta from afar. Uh, he's given a glass of champagne and challenged to offer a toast. And in his toast, he's essentially saying, hey, girl, right? I, you know, I've, I've got my eye on you. And she gets it, and she sings the Libiamo back to him, essentially saying, yeah, that's nice, never mind. I'm not. <laughs> Not really interested, but here you go. And they, and they toast. She has a coughing spell. Everybody's concerned because she's celebrating just getting over her illness. She says, no problem, no problem. Everybody go to eat, go into the other room. There's a wonderful reception in there. You know, leave me alone. Alfredo stays. 
uh, and he stays in order to make his case as a lover. And we get this wonderful duet, Undi Felice Eteria, and his phrases are all about what he's talking about, right? What he's pleading his case, making love to her musically. <laughs> When we get to the payoff, it's one of the best tunes that Verdi ever wrote. Perfectly Italianate tune. she respond? <laughs> it can't be more different, right? Verdi gets it. I mean, he, he really is underlining the text and the drama simply through melody. Do you think there's anything going on in the orchestra that's interesting? <laughs> no, not really. And that's pretty much throughout the opera. Now, there are moments of genius where, you know, a solo instrument or a, 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 one of the members of the, of the, one of the sections of the orchestra plays something beautiful and counterpoint. We'll hear that as we listen to the duet uh, later on. But, but um, no, for the most part, uh, the accompaniment in the orchestra could not be simpler. Everything is driven by melody. Um, one remarkable thing, to back up just briefly, is that this opera is based on a true story that happened in 1844. The young Alexandre Dumas, the author, falls in love with Marie Duplessis, who is a courtesan and a, a, a seminal leader in the demi-monde, the underworld in Paris. As she has gone from one wealthy lover to another, and she's got this beautiful home and this beautiful apartment where she has salons and musicales and poetry readings, and Dumas falls in love with her. Uh, it's a very tragic love affair, and she dies, I think at the age of 23 or 24, very, very young, and he writes a novel that is published in, let me get this absolutely perfect because it's very interesting, the, the La Dame aux Camélias in 1848. So three or four years after the real events happen, a novel, a Romana Clef, about his experience. And everybody sort of winks at it, but you know, everybody knew that it was true, that what he was writing about in the novel happened to him, and it was about Marie Duplessis, and everybody gossiped about it, and everybody read it, and everybody bought it. It was a huge success, and it was such a success that in 1852, he turned it into a drama, a play, and you can imagine in, in Paris, oh my God, the, if you think the book was salacious, <laughs> you know, let's go to the play, and people flocked to the play. Well, among the people who went to the play were Giuseppe and Giuseppina Verdi. Sitting in the audience on a night off from the Parisian premiere of Rigoletto and, and watching this Alexandre Dumas play and Verdi, it, it's a, you know, this, this has got to be the subject of the opera that the Teatro La Fenice has asked me to write. Um, 1853, it's premiered. Nine years between the time of the actual events and the time of the opera. Nixon in China by John Adams is more like 
12 to 15 years from the real events to the opera. Anybody hear of the opera Anna Nicole? About Anna Nicole Smith, who died in 2007, and the opera premiered in 2011. That's pretty, but that's contemporary opera. La Traviata was a contemporary opera. It was, it was about things that happened that people knew about because they read and because they went to plays. They went to see drama. And so it was very much alive for them. So here we come to the state censors in Venice at the Teatro La Fenice, and they said, no, no, you cannot put this on an opera stage. And Verdi fought and fought and fought. They finally backed down and said, well, if you put it, if, if, if you set it in the 18th century, we'll let you do La Traviata at La Fenice. And he did, and it was a complete flop. Because nobody could believe it. You know, the powdered wigs and the whole nine yards. There's no, it just doesn't fit. And so subsequent productions of La Traviata were done in contemporary style, 1853-1854 style. Um, the story is about the love affair, but I think the heart of the opera is what we're going to talk about right now, and that is the relationship between Alfredo's father, Germont, and Violetta. The father comes from Provence because rumor has it that his son is living in sin, living out of wedlock with a courtesan on the outskirts of Paris. Well, Germont's daughter, uh, Alfredo's younger sister, is about to be married to a boy from a fine family in the city, and they're hearing this rumor, and it would be scandalous to that family to be connected to the family of the Germont. So, Germont travels to Paris and finds Violetta. Uh, and this begins one of the most brilliant creations in opera history. It is this duet between Germont Père, the father, and Violetta, which begins in icy anger and ends up almost as if it were a father-daughter duet. The really remarkable thing about this duet is that it touches all five of the stages of grief that we think of as a very modern construct, but they're all there, not necessarily in order, but they're all there. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance. And the duet has that structure. It's really Remarkable. I'll try and point that out as we go through it. First of all, Germont is introduced by two measures of music that are played by the lower strings. And Verdi or Piave, his librettist, don't have to tell us any more about who Germont is than those two measures because of the rests between the notes. Uh, we realize that maybe he's limping, he's elderly, he's carrying a little extra weight, but because we're in the lower strings, the basses, the cellos, the violas, um, uh, it has that grounded sense, you know, that he's here. <laughs> he's, he's angry, he's ready for a fight, and in he walks. And of course, the first thing he says is, well, are you the woman who's destroying my son? You know, uh, and she gets angry, so the anger begins, and, and demands that he be polite to her, and he's impressed, and yet he still has something to ask of her, and that is that she give up Alfredo in order to save the marriage of this beautiful, pure, young girl back in Provence. Now, I've invited two singers here tonight to help us go through this wonderful duet. We won't hear the whole thing, we'll hear excerpts of it, but I think you need to hear it from real voices rather than me just playing at the piano. I'd like to invite to the stage soprano Sherilyn Larson and baritone Bernardo Bermudez.
And I want to remind you that you have the texts for this duet on the, the sheet that was handed out. So follow along, because I think you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. So there's this lengthy recitative before the beginning of the duet formally, uh, in which there's this angry exchange. And he says, you know, well, I, I've heard that Alfredo has been selling everything he owns in order to keep you two afloat. And she says, no, 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 no. And she shows him the receipts the bill of sale for the things that she's selling, antiques and pieces of furniture and costumes, things that you know she finds dear, selling them for cash to keep them afloat. She's doing it. And Alfredo knows nothing about that. And so Germont backs off a little bit, but he still wants to make his case, this pure young girl in Provence. Uh, and, and her impending marriage might be threatened by this sinful relationship. And so we get the beginning, the formal beginning of the duet from Germont, Pur si come un angelo. When Germont is finished pleading his case, Violetta is so moved, she says, I understand, of course. Uh, we'll break up for a while. It'll be hard, but then we'll be able to come back together, right? Bargaining. Bargaining. Uh, and, and for a brief moment, she thinks, you know, this is going to work out. And we get this wonderful conversational melody. This sort of conversational idea um, that we're, that, that's in in a major key, and it's just you know she says, oh yeah, no problem, I'll you know we'll we'll split for a while, it'll be painful, and then it's repeated, and then the last time that it's repeated, it's in the minor key, and then we get her heartbeat, which gets faster and faster, but not too fast, I promise. <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's brilliant, and the bargaining, you know, is, is perfectly limbed out in the music underneath. Fast-moving dramatic change, right? Uh, moving from almost comfort, oh, I understand what you want me to do, to absolute abject uh, fear, terror, that this might actually happen, that he might demand that they break up forever. That's followed by non sapete. We get more piling on of the anger and the denial. Uh, she's explaining to Germont she's got no family, no one other than Alfredo, and revealing that she has this terminal disease. Listen to the frantic nature of this music. Again, notable more for its rests than for the notes. Non The re 
guests. She's breathless, absolutely breathless, as she reacts to what it is that he wants. Germont's response is not especially kind. He essentially tells her, you know what, one day your beauty's going to fade. That's not a good way to start a conversation. <laughs> and Alfredo being the man that he is, his eye is going to wander, he's going to be unfaithful, and then you'll be alone. Think about it. Think about it. Now, any other composer would have probably taken this beautiful melody and written it like this. Bernardo, let's, let's show them how another composer might have sung this uh, uh, part of the duet, Un di quando le venere. Un di quando le venere, il tempo avrà fugate. Yeah, beautiful melody, right? And is it a little familiar? But it's wrong, it's all wrong. How did Verdi actually write it? The rests are more important than the notes. Un di quanto le venere, il tempo avrà fugate, via presto il tedio a sorgere, che sarà lor, pensate. Isn't that fascinating? Well, it's a simple choice. And it's a choice out of a million possible choices. But the choice is absolutely right for the text and for the moment. And it's all in the melody. What do you have in the accompaniment? Nothing terribly interesting, right? It's all melodically driven, this drama. Uh, at the end of this section, uh, she expresses her deepest moment of depression. Uh, we'll listen to his last phrase, which is still in a major key, and it feels like it's going to cadence into a major key, but no, we get an, an incredibly sad, melancholy moment for Violetta, and it's marked con estremo dolore, with deepest sorrow. <laughs> I'm just terribly attracted to because it's so syncopated. Uh, and not only do you have this wonderful syncopation, but in the middle of it all, way down in a lower instrument, I'm not, I should have checked to see what instrument it was. I, I guess it would be a bassoon or cello or maybe both of them together. You get this little counter melody. this terribly difficult to put together syncopation in the voices and in the other instruments of the orchestra. It's here that Violetta expresses acceptance. And it could not be simpler and more beautiful. In fact, it's almost childlike. A very simple accompaniment, like the rest of the opera, 
but the most gorgeous melody where she says, tell that beautiful young girl there's someone who will make this ultimate sacrifice for her. <laughs> mm. 
Now there is one more movement, and actually there are five movements in this duet, which is another explosion of the Italian tradition, uh, but it, it, it pretty much underlines what everything that's happened. It's moro, um, uh, and and. We don't have time, frankly, to, to, to hear it. Uh, but the duet, is, it, it's an incredible creation. But even more is the creation of Falstaff. Verdi was always attracted to Shakespeare. And according to himself, uh, he grew up reading Shakespeare. I'm not sure that's entirely true. But obviously, it must have been in Italian translation. He could not speak or read English. He was pretty good at French, but not English, and certainly Italian. Uh, but he read them, I'm sure, in Italian translation, fell in love with the stories, and actually wrote three uh, Shakespeare operas, Macbeth, Otello, and Falstaff, and attempted very hard on a couple of different occasions to write a King Lear. Would that we have gotten a Verdi Lear. Would have been absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> but let me tell you a personal story to sort of introduce you to this new world at the end of Verdi's career, 40 years after the premiere of La Traviata. First time I saw Otello, it was here in San Diego. I don't remember the performance, so I can't tell you whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. But it was back in the late 60s or early 70s. <clears throat> and uh, I was so frustrated during that performance. I could not understand what Verdi was trying to do. None of those melodies were there. There was no blossoming of melody that you get in the, in, in the middle period Verdi operas that we all know and love, like Trovatore and Traviata, Rigoletto, uh, Un Ballo in Mascara that we saw a couple of seasons back. <clears throat> it simply wasn't there. And it left me frustrated, almost angry. And you know, what on earth was he thinking? No wonder nobody goes to this opera. Yeah, well. And now it's become my favorite opera, Otello. Um, I had no clue. It took me 15 or 20 years to figure out what makes these last two operas tick. What was he after? I mean, now I know that Verdi's career can be described as a constant drive to find truth in drama, verisimilitude. Constantly, he was absolutely true to human feeling and emotion and human action in a drama. And if that didn't work for him, he wasn't interested. Or in the case of a couple of really early operas, he was bored and he wrote them anyway. But he learned very quickly that the drama has to be inexorable. The audience has to be brought forward. And in Traviata, that's done melodically. In Otello and Falstaff, particularly Falstaff, it's done motivically. Not melodies, but shorter melodic cells. Shorter melodies, if you will, but we call them motives. We won't mention Wagner, but he was in the air, right, in, at that time. And everybody was influenced by Wagner, perhaps, perhaps, even Verdi, dare I say it? Um, you know, and of course the Italians didn't believe anything good could come from across the Alps. <laughs> from Hannibal on, there's is, is no, no way. Uh, but, but, this, but, but, but motivically in an Italian sense. So you get these melodies, and they're just these little, these little bursts of melody, and you think, oh, this is going to blossom into this gorgeous, full-blown thing, and it never does. And that left me frustrated when I really didn't understand it, when I wasn't paying attention to the text. And back then, without supertitles, I, I admit, you know, they're a great help. And if you have to sort of memorize the libretto before you go and know exactly what's going on, it's really difficult to appreciate what a composer is doing musically. Thank goodness for supertitles, because now you'll hear every word, every image in the text, every action on stage has a musical metaphor underneath it. So what happens? We're, 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 we're pulled through the opera 
with a sense of dynamism and inexorability by these short motives that begin to blossom and don't, we just go to the next one, and go to the next one, and go to the next one. And it's like a telescoping kind of structure. Uh, and then the orchestra is much more involved, much more involved. The orchestra comments on what's going on. And this wasn't necessarily something that would happen in earlier Verdi operas, where the orchestra is given so much to do. It's no longer just, it's much more complicated than that. And the other thing is, the, is simply the fact that in Otello and Falstaff, there's just a lot of text. <laughs> Arrigo Boito was the librettist. He was a playwright, a poet, as well as a musician and composer. And he really understood Shakespeare. Some say that Othello is better than Othello. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> uh, but, and Falstaff is based on the character Falstaff, not any one play, although there's a lot more of Merry Wives of Windsor in it than the Henry plays, which are the three plays that, that Falstaff shows up in. But I want to give you a perfect example of how the entire opera of Falstaff works by uh, presenting for you the honor monologue at the end of Act I of Falstaff. Falstaff is at the inn, and he's in arrears with his bill. He can't pay his bill. Now, for a man who is bigger than life, um, and who is filled with hubris, and thinks that he's God's gift to women and politics and everything else in the world, uh, and he can't pay his bill. So he can't be embarrassed, right? He's not going to show any embarrassment or weakness. So he tells his henchmen, Bardolf and Pistol, Bardolfo and Pistola, to take two love letters uh, to two wealthy women, two women who have very wealthy landowner husbands, Alice Ford and Meg Page. And he gives a letter to each of them and says, and this actually happens before the opera opens, go to them and, and give them these love letters. And it, it come to find out in this first scene, Bardolph and Pistol did not deliver the letters. And Falstaff asks them, why? Why didn't you deliver the letters? Well, our honor would not allow us to do such a thing. And that's the setup for the honor monologue. Honor! Ladri, he calls them, you thieves, you ruffians. And then he just lets loose on them with this cascade of words and images that is absolutely perfect for setting to music. Let's invite Bernardo Bermudez back to help us with this. Now, we're going to take a few phrases by themselves um, so that you understand a little bit better what's going on. And then at the end, Bernardo and I will perform this entire monologue um, whole. But um, uh, again, he's so angry. And by the way, what's interesting is that as the opera goes on, we discover that Meg and Alice are very good friends. And they share the letters with each other. And the letters are absolutely word for word the same. <laughs> See, you're laughing. This is a great comedy. It's really wonderful. All right, so it begins with l'onore, and you'll hear three notes, two notes, and the orchestra repeats it as if commenting on what Falstaff has just sung. This is just the l'onore and ladri. Uh, So where are we, right? I mean, boy, has he you know, grabbed our attention. And we know exactly what we, where we are and the, the emotion that's just running through that big, fat body. Not yours, Bernardo. The, the, <laughs> the character falls down. And those same two notes, it's F and E, that he sang on Lonore and Ladri, uh, start this next little figure, which is completely different from what we just heard. Uh, you too are true to your honor, you, you sewers of disgrace. <laughs> Sempre. 
Yeah, it's a completely different idea from, and we just, we go somewhere else. Now what's interesting is here, as he says, yes, even I, I must sometimes put aside the fear of God, even I, uh, and by necessity, put aside my honor, right? And we get a real honest to goodness melody. And one of those melodies that I thought during Otello would blossom into something gorgeous, and it doesn't, it just moves on. Uh, nostro. Nostro, io stesso, si, hi, io, devo talor da un lato, con il timore di Dio, e per le tessi. Yeah, a gorgeous tune, right? But you want it to, um, and well, that's not Verdi, but, <laughs> but you want it to you know, grow, you want it to blossom, and it doesn't. Where do we go? We get a completely new idea uh, and use tricks and lies, stratagems to get by to avoid trouble. How do we avoid trouble? By being snaky and sneaky. Almost drawing a picture of wandering. Um, usare, yeah. Usare strada che viene equivoci per stregiar con le tane. Yeah, a completely different idea, followed by another idea, but we're going to go just a little bit further to the honor portion. He asks these questions of Bardolph and Pistol. Can honor fill your belly? No. Can honor set a broken leg? No. You get the picture. Um. Un onore riempirvi la pancia. No. Un onore rimettervi uno stinco. Non può. Ni un piede. No. Ni un dito. No. Ni un capello. No. And then a melody that's completely different from the orchestra. What is it? A word. And what's in this word? The gentle breeze. It's just air. And what do we get in the orchestra? So you get the idea. I mean, every single image in this opera, not just in this monologue, not just in this Shakespearean, very Shakespearean soliloquy that happens to be accompanied by the music of Verdi, uh, is underlined, is drawn, is given to us by these, these seemingly unattachable motives that have no relationship to each other, and yet, when you stand back and listen to it, it works. So let's stand back, listen to it, and allow it to work. Yes, 
Oh! 